A true nightmare for one Catholic school family. Their child wrongfully listed as attending a public school, a mistake that led to a child abuse investigation. I'm Emily Druby and that's ahead. House Democrats announced they'll try to impeach President Trump for a second time, drawing up one article against him. Then New York City opens up two 24-7 vaccination sites, hoping to ramp up the number of people vaccinated after a dismal start. Plus, the Vatican rolls out their vaccines, Pope Francis saying he'll get the shot and that it's everyone's ethical obligation to do the same. And a new documentary honoring the memory of Brooklyn-born Bishop Francis Xavier Ford, the missionary and martyr on the road to sainthood. The news starts right now. There's nothing worse. There's just nothing worse to be accused of as a parent the Department of Education sending child services to the home of an honor student at Zavarian High School because he didn't show up for class at a public school he never enrolled in. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. The Department of Education is calling it a very bad mistake, but how could this happen? Currents News' Emily Druby joins us now with more on what exactly went wrong and how. Hi, Emily. Hi, Christine, a very bad mistake indeed. Now, the Brooklyn Public School had high schooler John Tomasi on their roster, despite the fact he was never enrolled by his parents and he spent his entire education in Catholic schools. Now, the family didn't even know what was happening until a child abuse investigator showed up on their doorstep. This is his real report card. Margaret Green Tomasi has her son John's real report card stashed next to two fakes. Fakes that set off a child abuse investigation. This was the letter from ACS that it's a suspected child abuse or maltreatment. It started when the Administration for Children's Services or ACS showed up at their door. I said ACS and she said yes there's um, an investigation open for John Tomasi. I said for what? She said um, he's not attending Cobble Hill High School. I said, well, that's crazy because he attends Varian High School. John had been attending the Bay Ridge Catholic High School. The former Catholic Academy student had never been to public school. But for some reason, John was on the roster at Cobble Hill School of American Studies in Brooklyn. They never got the message he wasn't coming. He was marked absent for months, prompting the abuse investigation. John's mom says the visit was terrifying and included interviews, a search of their home, even physically checking John for signs of abuse. Somebody knocked on your door and that they can potentially take your child from the home. Obviously, that wasn't going to happen. That didn't happen. But for the first time in my life, that could happen. And there are no words. And that wasn't all. Around the same time, a public school report card came for John. It was filled out. And he's in progress in algebra. Margaret couldn't get in touch with the school so they could clear up the mistake. Finally, someone from the Department of Education said they would take John off the list. At the same time, the ACS investigation came back as unfounded. And I thought, okay, this is over. But then another filled out report card showed up in the mail. When I got that second report card, I got, I was fr afraid. I thought, can they reopen another investigation on me? They're still, he's still in that system. Only after the story spread did the deputy superintendent for Brooklyn schools finally reach out to Margaret and assure her it was a mistake. But Margaret still isn't 100% sure that it's over and the trauma is long lasting. And so is the ACS record. And it doesn't get expunged for another 10 years. So it's closed, but I don't know what that means. How closed is it? That's very frightening to me. She says they only had one warning from the school back in October when she received John's schedule in the mail. After multiple calls and emails to the school, she figured it was just a mistake, a decision she greatly regrets. But still, she's confused as to how it got this far. How do you admit someone they have no transfer transcripts, they have no um, immunization records, he's never been to public school, so where did this child come from? One of the reasons Margaret's speaking out about the situation is to warn other parents to stay vigilant and to never give up. Now, we did reach out to the school, but we haven't heard back. However, the Department of Education did tell us this shouldn't have happened and that the matter is being investigated. Christine. Emily, the pandemic has really affected the New York City public school system. Does Margaret think that it was a factor here? 
Christine, it was definitely a factor in her trying to get the situation fixed with a lot of people working from home at both the school and the DOE. Margaret had to rely on phone calls and emails, which weren't always answered. Also, this case clearly highlights flaws in the New York City public schools attendance system during the pandemic. Christine. All right, Emily, thank you. House Democrats have announced a resolution to impeach President Trump, charging him with one count of incitement of insurrection after last week's violence at the Capitol. This as Republicans blocked a move to have the president stripped of his power under the 25th Amendment. Inciting insurrection. Oh, he has to pay a price for that. Democrats formally introduced an impeachment resolution Monday morning, the first move toward holding an impeachment vote against President Donald Trump this week. Democrats tried to first take up a resolution urging Vice President Mike Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment through unanimous consent, but it was blocked by Republicans. A resolution calling on Vice President Michael R. Pence to convene and mobilize the principal officers of the executive departments of the cabinet to activate section four of the 25th amendment to declare president Donald J. Trump incapable of executing the duties of his office and to immediately exercise powers as acting president. I object. The single article charges Trump with incitement of insurrection for his role in the riots at the U.S. Capitol last Wednesday. It also references the president's call to the Georgia Secretary of State. The co-sponsor of the article of impeachment, Representative Dan Kildee, gone. says the that vote could come on Wednesday go. if Pence doesn't act to invoke a vote Let's on the 25th back. Amendment. We'll move uh, as quickly as possible uh, to take the, impeach the impeachment article to the floor of the House and act Perfect. upon it. The move by Democrats is intended to put pressure on Vice President Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment. Pope Francis speaking out about the chaos at the Capitol during his weekly Angelus, urging political leaders and the public to protect American values, saying nothing is earned by violence and so much is lost. Sorto le autorità dello Stato e l'intera popolazione a mantenere un alto senso di responsabilità al fine di rasserenare gli animi, promuovere la riconciliazione nazionale e tutelare i valori democratici radicati nella società americana. The Holy Father also prayed for the victims who died as a result of the violence. Cardinal Dolan also addressed the Capitol Hill attack in a Twitter post. He expressed his concern that President Trump may have instigated the demonstrators' actions. It all seemed to be exacerbated by the fact that the man who should be a voice of reason in encouraging us to law and order and civility and unity, namely the president, uh, seemed to be the one uh, who was uh, stoking these flames. The Archbishop of New York says he had just returned from a retreat when he heard about the news. He condemned those who are looking to divide the country and said we need to listen to God the Father. While thousands of demonstrators stormed the Capitol Wednesday, bashing windows and busting through barriers, leaving five dead in their wake, there were many others at the rally earlier who were there peacefully. Despite the president's lawsuits faltering in court, many Americans still do not trust the results of the election. In fact, some church leaders were at the rally, among them Father Michael Panicali, a Brooklyn priest. He believes the vast majority of people there were peaceful, calling them patriots. We did see some people in the crowd trying to incite and agitate others. Hmm. We did abs absolutely see that. We saw this sort of uh, mentality of people trying to uh, stir up others. But the vast majority were just patriotic Americans, patriotic Americans who love their country, who love God, and who just wanted their voices heard and were there to pray. And it, it, we were labeled, there's a difference between Trump supporters hmm. and patriots. We were labeled Trump supporters, no. We were doing a patriotic duty because we love our country. Father Panicali believes that the efforts of some who went to the rally and did not commit any violence should be recognized. While he believes everyone should condemn violence, he also said this. Because while they condemn violence, which is appropriate, what they should have said was we applaud all those Americans who came from across the country as far away as Hawaii and California 
to be patriots, to ensure that a fair, fair and free election took place, who gave of their time, who brought elderly people, children, people with disabilities, just so that our voices are heard. Father Panicali says he just wishes that those peaceful Americans could receive some support instead of being lumped together with the angry mob. We're getting more information on the security plans made ahead of the chaos on Capitol Hill. According to reports, Capitol Police and the city's Metropolitan Police rebuffed offers days before for more help from the National Guard. Federal agencies issued no warning that the protests could turn violent, and the Department of Homeland Security met with local law enforcement only a day before the riots. Critics also blame poor planning and communication among federal, state, and local law enforcement for hindering the response. In light of the Capitol Hill chaos, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser is stepping up her security plans for Inauguration Day next week. The mayor is putting the city on high alert and asking all Americans to attend the swearing-in ceremony online. The District of Columbia is requesting the department extend the national special security event period um, from Monday, January 11th to Sunday, January the 24th. I am also urging the Department of Homeland Security uh, to coordinate with the Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, the United States Congress, and the United States Supreme Court to establish a security and federal force deployment plan for all federal property. The National Guard plans to send 15,000 troops to the inauguration. Mayor Bowser requesting the White House cancel all public gathering permits from now until January 24th. The NYPD has promised to lend a hand for the inauguration, sending 200 of New York's finest to D.C. The nation's capital has asked for 3,000 officers from departments around the country to help with the swearing in ceremony. Also attending the inauguration, Jesuit Father Leo O'Donovan, who will deliver the invocation on January 20th. The priest is a friend of the Biden family, even performing the funeral mass for Beau Biden in 2015. Father O'Donovan says Biden personally called to invite him to the service. There's a lot more news headed your way. Starting today, we can reach New Yorkers over 75 years old, the most vulnerable people, our seniors, our elders, we can reach them today. The Big Apple is going big with two new 24-7 vaccination sites, each location capable of vaccinating 2,000 people a day. But don't think you can lose the mask anytime soon. Even with a shot in the arm, you can still get COVID. We'll tell you why. And a beloved missionary now on the road to sainthood is remembered in a new documentary. The former editor of The Tablet will be here to talk about Bishop Ford's legacy when we come back. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News. As more of you are now able to receive the COVID vaccine, there's something you need to be aware of. Even if you get the shot, don't throw away your masks anytime soon. Health experts say you could still end up getting sick. Mandy Gaither tells us more. I would strongly encourage that we move forward with um, uh, giving states the, the opportunity to be uh, more expansive uh, in, in who they can give the vaccine to, particularly as more supplies become available. Health officials continue to say being vaccinated is one of the best ways to protect yourself and others from getting sick, but no vaccine works 100% of the time. During trials, the current authorized vaccines were shown to be about 95% effective, which means some who were vaccinated became symptomatic. Here's why. It takes time to build immunity, and both authorized vaccines require two doses given several weeks apart to train the body's immune system. But people can be exposed to the coronavirus right before being vaccinated or right after, which doesn't give the body enough time to develop its defenses. The CDC says building immunity typically takes a few weeks. Moderna measured its 95% vaccine efficacy starting 14 days after after the second dose, while Pfizer started seven days after the second dose. But let's be clear, the current coronavirus vaccines 
cannot infect anyone with the virus. They don't contain the virus. But the CDC says vaccinated people should still use all the tools available to us, wear a mask, stay six feet away from others, and wash your hands. I'm Mandy Gaither. New York City is ramping up efforts to distribute more COVID-19 vaccines. We have more and more sites opening up, including our 24-7 sites. And this is very exciting because there's a lot of people ready to get the vaccine literally all hours of the day, and we'll be able to accommodate them in all five boroughs. The city opened up two 24-7 vaccination hubs over the weekend, one in Brooklyn's Army Terminal, the other in the Bronx. Sites in Manhattan, Staten Island, and Queens are expected to open up this week. The mayor also announcing that people 75 and older, education workers, and child care staff are now eligible for that vaccine. But the rollout has been a bumpy one. States are starting to see an issue with vaccine doses going to waste. According to the CDC, more than 22 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been distributed nationwide so far, but fewer than 7 million people have received their first dose, forcing some hospitals to throw away doses that quickly expired after being taken out of cold storage. The issue is not the supply of the vaccine. The issue is not being able to get enough people injected with the vaccine. More than 2.2 million new COVID-19 cases and about 27,000 deaths were reported in the U.S. during the first 10 days of 2021. That's according to Johns Hopkins University. Health experts say the vaccine needs to get out more quickly in order to stop the spread of the new coronavirus variants. The Vatican is kicking off its vaccination efforts this week, and Pope Francis has signed up for his shot. In an interview over the weekend, the Holy Father addressed public concerns over the ethics of getting the COVID-19 vaccine, saying he believes that ethically everyone must get the vaccine. It's an ethical option because your health is at stake, your life, but also the lives of others. In other news from the Vatican, a new addition to Catholic law, Pope Francis announced that women are now allowed to carry out some duties during mass. In practice, women have been serving as lectors, Eucharistic ministers and altar servers for decades, but it's never been made official. The Pope hopes this move will show appreciation to women and laypersons, but he did reiterate that the Vatican reserves the priesthood solely for men. Still to come on Currents News. The church views that he died because he was a missionary there in China who did not abandon his people. A new documentary explores the life of Bishop Francis Xavier Ford, the Brooklyn native who died a martyr now on the road to sainthood. And it's a tablet tradition. The yearly Christmas art contest is about to wrap up. Make sure to get your child's artwork in the running. We'll tell you how coming up. Bishop Ford was a was a, a missionary, and he was, uh, you know, devoted to his people. A missionary who's been called a martyr, and who many would like to call a saint. A documentary about the life of Brooklyn-born Bishop Francis Xavier Ford is airing tonight, right after this newscast here on Net TV, on what would have been his 129th birthday. It's part of the Bishop Ford Guild's mission to promote his cause for sainthood. And Ed Wilkinson, former editor at The Tablet, helped create the documentary. He's here now. And so, Ed, tell us, why did you make this documentary? Well, Christine, the Bishop Ford Guild reached out to us and they asked us if we could uh, make a film to promote this cause and, and also to help them raise some money to promote the cause because it's a very costly thing to get somebody beatified these days. Sure. It's, a, it's a long process. Absolutely. And uh, so Terry Denellen, who is one of our producers over there and I, we went up to Mary Knoll and we did a lot of uh, research up there and Terry really was the guy who put the nuts and bolts together. I did a lot of the research and I did the interviews with him and it was just the two of us. It took us about a year to get it done and wow. originally the guild was going to take this out to parishes and to show it, you know, to help make their cause a little bit uh, better known. But instead, because of the pandemic, you're now having it airing on because the... Because of the pandemic, 
nobody could go out and speak in parishes. Right. You know, mm -hmm. they were practically closed down. So uh, we had this thing sitting on the shelf, and mm -hmm. I said to somebody, I said, I know we're going to do a lot of publicity about Bishop Ford around his birthday. Why don't we just show this documentary on TV? And, and they said, of course, you know, it's sitting here. Let's use it. And Great it's idea. A, it, it's a beautiful piece of work. Mm -hmm. It really is. Now tell us, why do you think his path to sainthood is taking so long? Well, actually, I don't think it's taken so long myself. It's, okay. uh, I think it's pretty quick. You know, in, in, in the past, it would take sometimes hundreds of years to get somebody canonized. Okay. But Bishop Ford, you know, today with, uh, with a lot more media, uh, the, you know, these people are better known. And mm -hmm. when somebody is martyred like that over in China, the word gets out and yeah. a devotion begins to follow him. Right. And so uh, I think we're going to see it hopefully in my lifetime. All right, I hope so, and it's a beautiful documentary. Let's take a quick look at a, a clip from the documentary. When it happened, he was uh, arrested, bound, marched through the streets, he and uh, an marital sister, convicted in a trial who, that we don't have any record of. Hmm. So what surprised you the most while making this documentary? I think what surprised me the most was reading about the uh, the forced march that he was put on to get to the prison camp. It was like 50 mi miles. He was marched through the streets and really mm. humiliated. Uh, and then the harsh conditions in the camp. Uh, one of the nuns who was arrested with him and, and put in the prison camp, she recalls seeing Bishop Ford in the camp thrown over the shoulder of somebody else like a sack of potatoes. Uh. His health had failed so badly mm. there. And so eventually he just died of natural causes in the communist prison camp. Right. So why should people watch this documentary? Well, I think uh, they should watch it because he's one of us. He's a Brooklyn boy. Right. He mm -hmm. came from right these streets that we came from. Mm -hmm. And he was a man with a great vision and a real dedication and commitment to the missions. Uh, he was a real genuine person. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, if Bishop Ford's not a saint, I don't know who is a saint. Hmm. So how can people donate to the guild? Uh, you can help the guild out by uh, go to the tablet.org. Mm -hmm. That's the site, the tablet.org. There's a wonderful article on there this week about the Bishop Ford Guild. And at the end of it, there's an enrollment form. So if somebody wants to get involved, better involved with the guild, they just fill that out and that they can participate in this course. Well, I think everybody should take a look at it. And um, I definitely will. Ed Wilkinson, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Christine. Stay tuned to watch the premiere of the Bishop Ford documentary right after this newscast at 7.30 p.m. There will also be an encore on Friday, January 15th at 8 p.m. In this week's tablet, you can find more coverage on the life and legacy of Bishop Ford, including this timeline focusing on the future saints' efforts to evangelize in China. You can also view this full page spread on the tablet's website. And finally, a reminder to parents, the annual Tablet Christmas Art Contest is ending soon. Students in grades 1st through 12th in Brooklyn and Queens are invited to express their faith through art with the theme, Keep Christ in Christmas. So if your child is interested, they can send their artwork to the tablet.org slash 2020 art contest. Remember, this is a digital art contest, so no physical artwork will be accepted at the tablet's office. One more thing, this Wednesday, January 13th is the deadline, so you have to submit those works of art before 5 p.m. that day. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.